Welcome to the Restitute or Orbis channel, and today we're going to step away from buildings and look into the world of trees. Trees are like buildings, though, in the fact that we oftentimes walk amongst them and we don't fully appreciate the wonder and grandeur of their presence. And yet, it's in the presence of trees that we can find other explanations and connections to the older tales of our land, connections to previous eras. Trees have many mysteries about them, and yet they could reflect a much greater lost glory that we're going to explore today and look for explanations in how trees connect to the old world. You were sleeping. You slept too long. We all have. It's time we woke. Time we stopped time we running. Stopped, running. Stopped, running. Stopped, running. Colossal trees are to be found everywhere across the land, and oftentimes we may or may not be aware of their wondrous stories and their tremendous appearances. Now, it should be noted that I have not studied dendrology, and I have never studied that academic field or discipline, but I am well aware of the system and the institutions that people who study dendrology operate within. And so I can understand that many of the conclusions are based on pre-existing conclusions. The size and grandeur of many trees we may be aware of, and as we mentioned with the Redwoods Forest, you can certainly find some of the greatest trees in existence. What we're told, though, is that these trees are extremely large and exceptional because of the fact that they've been in existence for a long time. We also have the example of the great Boabab trees in Madagascar. So while there are a great diversity in terms of different kinds of trees that we can consider, they all reflect the same commonalities with their tremendous size and amazing resilience to persist in different types of environments and weather patterns. We also have many legends that surround behind trees and myths that connect them to the very origin of our species and many origin stories that appear across the land in different cultures and their baseline foundations and how they define themselves. Consider the account of the American chestnut tree. The United States, America, being part of the New World and was once dotted by these very impressive chestnut trees. Indeed, they took up a lot of the area in what is today considered Appalachia. The chestnut tree was very impressive, though, because of the sort of wood that it provided. It was also resilient in its food supply and what it provided for the land, and it tragically disappeared in the 1800s with the introduction of a fungal pathogen that supposedly originated from Asia, although the specifics behind that are very vague, as many things behind the 1800s usually tend to be. Once this pathogen was introduced, there was a loss of billions, with a B, of these wondrous American chestnut trees. And this completely changed the availability of this wonderful construction material and the food supply that the chestnuts themselves provided. Now, you might think that the story of the demise of the American chestnut tree was from overlogging and overuse, because we understand that the chestnut tree provided the wondrous wood wood quality that can't be matched today, as with many other construction materials, of what came in the past. And the explanation behind that is, well, once this deadly pathogen was introduced from Asia by means unknown, I don't know, perhaps Perry brought it back in his expedition to Japan, who really knows for sure? But when we look at the images of these stunning trees and how they once covered the land, there was a saying that a squirrel could jump all the way from Maine down to Georgia without having its foot touch the ground. That was how extensive these American chestnut trees were. We also have no shortage of very stunning images that convey the size and immensity and the overall presence of these very spectacular trees. And we consider what their wood could have provided for construction quality material. We've explored many of the great wood mansions in the South before in other explorations, and we understand the fact that many of these great mansions have stood for over 200 years, and who knows how long they really stood, because of the quality of wood that was available with these great American chestnut trees. Now, naysayers will of course always tell us it's also because of overforestation now and because of the fact that many of our current forests are nowhere near as old, at least in terms of the age of the trees, as our older forests. And that is very well true and seems to be true in many facets. But the other thing that we may be overlooking is just how large and extensive trees and forests can be if they're left to their own devices. We have so many images, though, purportedly from the 1800s and the early 1900s, that give us an idea of the size and scope and immensity of these wondrous trees. 
And oftentimes when you see these images, you are transported to a completely different world. And it almost feels like it's a different world in many different ways because of the fact that you have the presence of these great trees. Much as we find ourselves transported to different worlds and we consider the once immense and wondrous architectural brilliance of the buildings that we saw from the 1800s and the early 1900s. You could say the same thing about the presence of these American chestnut trees. And I don't just want to stay focused on the American chestnut trees. I'm just highlighting that as an example because there's several explanations behind how the American chestnut trees provided the wondrous quality of construction material within their wood. And they also provided a food supply with the American chestnuts that were very nutritious and readily available. Well, that's no longer the situation with the advent and the introduction of this pathogen, this fungus that completely destroyed these trees. Now we're told that the root systems behind the trees can never be completely eradicated by the fungus, but it's quite a tragedy when you think about the fact that the entire landscape was once covered with these impressive and tremendous trees. And what are your thoughts on what they could have provided with construction materials and food supply? There's also the concept of how we have theories that in the older civilizations or the previous eras that there was a better balance achieved between the civilization and nature itself. And imagine what sort of advantages that would have. Now, of course, we're told in our current civilization that there is a focus on achieving balance with our environment. It's one of our highest priorities. And yet at the same time, for reasons unknown to us, our best efforts always seem to create more problems or don't necessarily solve the challenges that we have and perhaps it's simply because we don't possess the technology at this time or perhaps because we simply haven't innovated ways that worked for achieving balance with nature although somehow we seem to do it in the past in this map you can get an idea for how extensive the american chestnut tree used to be and the amount of terrain that it covered and imagine all the benefits that having such wonderful construction material and readily available food supplies would be, whether it was for the Native Americans or the <clears throat> recently arrived settlers that were told all came from Europe, and some of their logging efforts. And indeed, some of these images you have, you can see the amount of resources that were required to conduct logging of this very impressive American chestnut wood. And you can see that there were no shortage of individuals that were standing around posing for pictures. It's almost as though these individuals are as amazed by these trees as we are just looking at them. And this is how they decided to celebrate the presence of these trees, by cutting them open a little bit and posing in pictures to show their size and immensity. Now, to be fair, I do have some images of redwoods mixed in with these images of American chestnuts, but it serves the overall theme of the fact that there are many great trees that are across the land and they have many different stories tied to them. Now we're often told, and supposedly we can confirm the exact age of a tree by cutting it down and cutting the number of rings that are within its trunk. Yet at the same time, you can see that trees have a different story behind them, and I've always questioned, how do we know the exact age of these trees? For example, if one of these redwoods is 400 to 600 years old, well, how many human generations is that? Now, of course, we have total confidence in our ability to maintain archives and to effectively pass accurate information through generations, and no one even blinks, although you might remember that example from that episode of The Simpsons where they started the message, where one person whispered a message to the next, and by the time it got to the front of the line, Edna Krabappel was mad at Principal Skinner over the Purple Monkey dishwasher. If you've seen the episode, you know what I'm talking about. The point being is that we have such faith in our archives and our records and our many different governments that have existed over time that we don't believe that they would actually have any errors with maintaining the historical account. But I think that's one of the things that amazes me the most when you consider trees is that it's a natural life form. It's something that is completely across the land in many different areas except for the most arid areas. Although we're going to take a look at a couple examples of some trees that have actually managed to flourish in arid areas which are quite extraordinary. The American chestnut tree is one of the main examples though of something that we had in the past and that we've lost in present times. Now we can accept the given account that the reason that the American chestnut tree is gone is because of the very fortuitous introduction of this fungal pathogen that completely destroyed it. And yet isn't it odd that 
a once great natural resource that was completely across the land that provided food and construction material is now no longer available. It wasn't because of over logging, logging couldn't destroy 4 billion trees, but something else did, something that seemed to specifically target the trees. It's a very strange account, and we have many other strange accounts about how certain things that benefited the population and the wildlife are now no longer available. Now, I'm not saying that we have reason to question the account on how these trees were destroyed. I'm just stating that it's very peculiar that something that was so beneficial to so many was just suddenly eradicated overnight. And I think that's one of the things that we have to remember whether we're looking at trees or buildings or the account of civilizations is how things connect. What's the cause and effect behind many different aspects? Oftentimes we tend to neglect the overall cause and effect because we have a given account and because it's been repeated so many times that we just go along with it because repetition and that which we learn first is that which we tend to retain and that's that which we'll develop an emotional attachment to. When you look at this impressive image though here from the redwoods and you get an idea of just how extensive these great trees are and what they could really offer, we also consider the actual accounts that we had of the large dinosaurs. Now, typically what will be told by the mainstream is in the distant past, things were larger. We had larger flora, we had larger fauna in the past, and it's all easily explainable because we had a very different environment at that time. The climate was very different. There have been changes to the land over time. Interestingly enough, though, when you look at many of the myths and legends that are across all civilizations, you'll find a similar account. The only thing that really varies is the actual timeline. Mainstream science will tell us that this was a process that took millions of years, tens of millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. And yet, when you look at the myths and the legends, it seems to be on a much shorter timeline. Of course, we oftentimes find that conflict within the development of our own civilization. The impressive view, though, of many of these trees, and if you haven't been to the Redwood Forest, or if you haven't seen any of these other great trees in Madagascar, or and if you ever find yourself in the Arabian Sea in Yemen to look at some of the incredible trees there, such as the Heart of the Dragon, I strongly suggest you find a way to look at some of the trees even in your own local area because you will find quite a variance in terms of what these trees are capable of. And I always found the fact that there were trees extraordinary as this in such an arid area as something that really shows the persistence and durability of life that oftentimes we overlook. Now, imagine what a civilization could do that would achieve a balance with this sort of life and nature and what they could really reflect, managing to combine the artificial with the natural. That always seems to be something that we're told that we struggle with to this day. These incredible boabab trees in Madagascar have a very unique appearance to them as well, and we're informed that they're able to store water within their vast trunks and their entire root and stem structure. And that's how they're able to continue to persist in areas that oftentimes can be arid. Yet at the same time, when you look at these trees, you can see that they have a wondrous appearance to them, that they seem to show a different sort of landscape. And I'm oftentimes left with the questions that could these trees and their presence in many different areas have actually been originated from somewhere else, a previous civilization? The real question comes down to, though, what's really natural and what's really artificial? Because I am well familiar with the whole concept of how we've changed animals over time, such as how we've bred certain characteristics in horses to be true. Could the same thing have been done with trees in the distant past? Could we be seeing the remnants of once great trees? Or could there have been even more natural trees that were much more grand than these very stupendous examples that we're looking at right now? Because oftentimes when you look at trees from across the land that you're not familiar with, they suddenly become much more awe-inspiring than the trees that you may be used to. Now, whether you're from the United Kingdom, the United States, Africa, Asia, it doesn't really matter because of the fact that you can appreciate the very trees that are in your own backyard and have an understanding for the story that they have to tell us. And that's what I was alluding to earlier. What's the true story behind the development of these trees? Are the trees part of natural development that were simply allowed with the quote-unquote concept we have of evolution? Or was there a little bit more of a intervention that was put into certain trees? Is there a reason that there is such a vast variance in trees and what environment that they connect to? 
Now I know the people that are supporters of the mainstream account will tell me it's simply because there's different environments and the trees adapted to them. Yes, adaptiveness and the evolutionary theory, it all makes sense. Here we have what is supposedly the largest redwood tree, Hyperion, and this is in northwestern California. And I'll give you a warning that while you can find the exact coordinates of this tree, it is not currently legal to go and see this tree personally for various reasons. We're told that because the presence of human beings is disrupting the natural environment around the tree. Isn't that amazing that we have one of the largest trees in the land and you can't go near it legally? So you've heard it from this channel first. But there are many other trees in the redwoods and across the land that you can still go and experience in person. Again, I go back and I consider what we're told about the impressive size of the dinosaurs. And when we consider the legend of dragons from the earlier Middle Ages exploration this week, we can see that there are different accounts that do tell us from the mainstream that there was much larger life forms in the past. Again, they just tell us that it was on a longer timeline. Such as the example of the ancient redwood. We're told that the ancient redwood reached heights of nearly 900 feet, as opposed to the current giant redwood, which is only 350 feet. Now is that true or is there another developmental path that we're not aware of? Could it be possible that trees were far larger than the redwood? Could it have been possible that in past civilizations we actually had a better integration with the concept of life, with many of the great flora and fauna that went across the land? Or did the previous civilizations actually influence it and change it? We have to consider the fact that there may be a lot more truth and veracity in myth and legend than we like to admit. Now, you might be looking at this image and you're thinking, there's no way in heck he's going to suggest that this is actually the trunk of a tree that's been taken down. It's far too large. It's just simply a rock face. It may well indeed just be rock that simply resembles a tree trunk. And maybe it's all just in our imaginations. And yet, when you look at other renderings and depictions of the large trees taken to a colossal level that we looked at earlier, Suddenly, there seems to be a lot of similarity, though, in the potential in the images. Now, once again, defenders of the mainstream narrative will simply tell us that we're using our imaginations too much, that it's not possible that these great structures, such as Devil's Tower here in Wyoming, could have ever been the trunk of a tree. We're told officially that this is merely the result of a volcano, and the lava flow from an ancient volcano created this very interesting anomaly that's still on the land to this day and was featured quite prominently in the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Of course, if you look closely at the top of Devil's Tower, you find some very peculiar observations. And if you've ever actually walked on the top of Devil's Tower, granted you have to climb to the top of it, you'll find some other observations. Now, again, I'm not going to tell you exactly what to think. I'm merely just showing you images and considering the different possibilities. Does this look like a tree stump? Or does it simply look like a rock mesa? Is it the result of a volcanic eruption or being the core of a long extinct volcano? Or is it actually the stump of a once epic and large colossal tree? And we have other terrain features that we can still look at that for whatever reason give us the indication that they could be ancient tree stumps from eras long past. And once again, these will be dismissed as simply the products of wild imagination and speculation. And if there's one thing you shouldn't do in this current era, it's use your imagination. But just think on what possibility we could have had for ancient colossal trees in the past if those were in fact tree stumps that we're looking at. We do have accounts from multiple myths, legends, and origin stories from every major religion and culture across the land that indicate that there were once large trees. And by large trees, I mean colossal trees that reached up to the very sky, that were taller than the mountains themselves. That the availability of life support on the land in the past was far greater than it is now. Now there's a variety of theories and explanations for how this was possible. That there was a water canopy in some theories, or other theories about how the nature of the land was able to support life on a much larger scale. It is interesting to me that our mainstream account does corroborate that account when it says that in the distant past the land was very different, or the planet as they call it, and they'll tell us that on the planet or the land, whatever you want to refer to it as, life was able to be supported because of a different environment. And yet we also look at our five eras theory and we speculate and theorize that the previous civilizations achieved a much better balance between the artificial and the natural. And indeed, if they did, perhaps they did have some part to play in how many of these great trees evolved. 
Or perhaps these wondrous trees of the distant past were something that were even beyond their ability to fully understand or manipulate. Who knows for sure? But it is an interesting account that we simply can't ignore with all the myths and legends that we have of colossal trees that were across the landscape, the original tree of life, and what it could have really represented. There's also the repetitiveness in the legend and the myth of the existence of such colossal trees, and many different stories that account to how they existed and were interfaced with by the civilization at that time. And once again, the mainstream will simply tell us that such large trees did not exist. Yes, it's possible that we had dinosaurs, we have bones that prove it, although you only find fossilized remains. And we always seem to put such a premium in terms of the veracity of what we find with fossils. Although, interestingly enough, when you try to verify what's been located and determined with fossils, you have many conflicting accounts. And you'll simply be told that an image such as this is merely the product of wild fantasy and imagination, that it's not possible that there ever could have been a time frame where an individual on horseback could have viewed a tree of this scale. Even though when we look at the actual trees earlier in this exploration that do exist, they could have possibly existed to that size and that scale. And finally, taking this to its logical conclusion, if we consider the fact that in the distant past, there were great trees that reached to the very sky, that they had the ability within the land and the support of particular resources to reach the greatest heights. And then of course, the very concept of the tree of life and what it really reflects. What are your thoughts on the existence of colossal trees in the distant past? And what do you think about the origin myth of the tree of life? Let me know in the comments. Or do you believe that the mainstream tells us exactly as it is? Well, I want to transition over here and take a look at Old World New York. Old World New York is a new channel that's just taken off on YouTube, and I'll attach the link on the description of this video. And he shared these wonderful images of the Jones Beach Water Tower here with us. Now, we've looked at these standpipe water towers before, most extensively in St. Louis. Long Island in New York is a treasure trove of many old world wonders, and this water tower is quite spectacular. Supposedly constructed during the 1920s, it reflects the finest of the Art Deco architecture movement, because of course if you're going to build a standpipe water tower, you need to integrate the finest Art Deco detailing within it. I mean, how could you actually have a standpipe water tower that doesn't have this wonderful decoration in it? And remember, this is the 1920s, when the United States was in the roaring 20s, and we just had all the time and all the resources to do whatever we wanted to. When you look at the layout of this impressive water tower, though, it gives you the idea that there was a lot more that was involved, and we seem to see a very unique integration of patterns with the artificial structure and the land itself going back to what we talked about with the nature of balance and the patterns that go along with the water tower. I never cease to be amazed though by the presence of these standpipe water towers and these are far more common than we're led to believe. In fact, they seem to be far more present in many areas that we wouldn't think on. There's even this uh, wonderful pool area that accompanied the water tower and you can see that this is a very finely crafted and very well built structure. That once again reflects the wonderful tenets of what we're told are Art Deco. The tower itself reminds me of uh, many Campanile towers and other towers that we've looked at across the land. For some reason, this reminds me of the Campanile at Iowa State University. Although, again, I'm not talking about Iowa State University in this particular exploration. Although it should be noted that uh, they do have a slew of specialists who look at trees as well, you know, given their agricultural background. Ice cream parlor. Now that's an ice cream parlor I would love to go to with that kind of art deco styling. I'm sure you could go in there and you could find your greatest chocolate delights. When you look at the water tower though, you can see that it does reflect the grandeur of appearance and the lighting that we see in many other great locations and other towers and obelisks that reach to the very sky. Another one of those facets that we find with old world explorations. This is our one construction photo of it and of course we have our usual issues that I don't have to recount to you right now concerning the construction photo. And I would certainly like to thank Old World New York for providing these images and sharing this with us. And by all means, visit, visit his channel and check him out. I always love how we just have people standing around during this construction. I mean, this is how you really construct something. You just stand around and talk about it and it'll be built. No wonder we could do anything in the 1920s. So as a final bonus on this exploration, I wanted to consider the monster study. 
The monster study, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, was a stuttering experiment performed on 22 orphan children in Davenport, Iowa in 1939, conducted by one Wendell Johnson at the University of Iowa. Graduate student Mary Tudor, that Mary Tudor, conducted the experiment under Johnson's supervision. Half the children received positive speech therapy, praising the fluency of their speech, and the other half, negative speech therapy, belittling the children for speech imperfections. Ah, yes, authority figures belittling people. Sounds familiar? What an experiment. Many of the normal speaking orphan children who received negative therapy in the experiment suffered negative psychological effects. What a surprise. And some retained speech problems for the rest of their lives. So let me get this straight. An experiment by an individual at a university that caused speech problems in children for the rest of their lives. It was dubbed the Monster Study, as some of Johnson's peers were horrified, I'm glad to see someone was horrified at this, that he would experiment on orphan children to confirm a hypothesis. The experiment was kept hidden for fear Johnson's reputation would be tarnished in the wake of human experiments conducted by the Nazis during World War II. Wait a minute, why is this Wendell Johnson's reputation so important that it would be more important than the welfare of the lives of others? Oh. I know because he's a scientist, of course. Because the results of the study were never published in any peer-reviewed journal, Tudor's thesis is the only official record of the details of the experiment. The University of Iowa publicly apologized for the monster study in 2001. Well, they're far ahead of other institutions and governments when it comes to human experimentation because oftentimes they don't apologize or when they do, it's well after the fact. Granted, this is well after the fact, and they supposedly did pay reparations as well to the survivors when they were in their 70s, you know, after their entire lives were ruined. However, Patricia Zabrowski, University of Iowa Assistant Professor of Speech Pathology and Audiology, notes that the data that resulted from the experiment is the largest collection of scientific information on the phenomenon of stuttering, and that Johnson's work was the first to discuss the importance of the stutterer's thoughts, attitudes, beliefs, and feelings that continues to influence views on stuttering greatly. And you can certainly read the rest of the article at your own leisure and find out exactly how they conducted this lovely monster study. And yes, I'm being very sarcastic. I am quite frankly shocked and disturbed by this. I'm even more disturbed, though, that in 2001, this Patricia Zabrowski, whoever this person was and what they said, if it's true or not, a assistant professor of speech pathology, would actually say that they could justify this terrifying experiment that ruined the lives of several individuals because it was for science. I mean, what next? Did you ever see the black hole where Dr. Hans Reinhardt lobotomized his crew because they refused the order to return home because he wanted to explore the black hole? Perhaps he just should have gone home after he went through the black hole, and this Patricia Zabrowski would have said he was right to lobotomize his crew. It was I for science, right? And if you look into Dr. this Reinhardt. Wendell Johnson, you'll find out that he was actually a stutterer, according to the official account, when he was born. Although apparently he overcame it, to his credit, and earned various degrees and worked at the University of Iowa. Of course, in this official account of him in the archives, you'll see no mention of this monster study. So, it's quite clear they did a very good job of protecting his reputation. And again, I ask, why was this Wendell Johnson's reputation so important? I mean, was he the Dr. Hans Reinhardt of his day, or was it because he had good intentions? And at the end of the day, as Dr. Hans Reinhardt himself said in 1979's Disney for, film, The Black Hole, Immortality? and I'll leave it at no. that. What are your Scientific thoughts on this monster study? And if you're interested in looking at the U.S.'s dabbling in human experiments, I'll attach this little article that this came out in 2011, where the mainstream media actually shared all the human experimentation that the United States itself engaged in. But don't worry, for the specific Guatemala syphilis experiment, the United States apologized. And I would think there should be an apology for actions such as this. I mean, experiments on humans without their consent? It's terrifying. What's the apology actually say? Oh, there is no apology. They deleted it. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on all this? Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. I want to hear how so